I'm Jim Brown, your Bible teacher here at Grace and Truth Ministries. I'm going to read some, I read some of our emails to start with, and I brought my iPhone up here. I'm going to show you something that you can use your iPhone to do. Sometimes these questions you ask me are right at your fingertips on your iPhone. All kinds of information on your computer and your iPhone. I had somebody write to me and they said, this is ESP James commented on the origin of the Pharisees, the rabbis of the Babylonian synagogue, the verbal law, Halakha. Can you tell me were the early Pharisees called Hasidims, H-A-S-S-I-D-E-A-N-S, or Hasidim, H-A-S-I-D-E-D-I-M? You can look up Hasidim on your iPhone if you've got one, and it will say Hasidic Judaism, H-A-S-I-D-I-C. Hasidism, sometimes spelled Hasidism, C-H-A-S-S-I-D-I-S-M, also known as Hasidic. Judaism is Jewish religious group that arose as a spiritual revival movement in the territory of the contemporary Western Ukraine during the 18th century and spread rapidly through the Eastern Europe. Then he gave you all kinds of questions. What are Hasidic beliefs? And then you punch your button there. Hasidic beliefs. The Hasidic ideal is to live a hallowed life in which even the most mundane action is sanctified. Hasidim live in tightly knit communities known as courts. They are spiritually centered around a dynastic leader known as Rebbe who combines political and religious authority. And then they say, what is a Hasidic woman? You can look up all kinds of things on this. A Hasidic woman is a woman that is unique face of American Judaism. They, it'll tell you everything about it. What is meant by Hasidim? What does Hasidic hair mean? And then it'll tell you why these guys wear these long curls on the side of their... And they use the Bible to twist it. And it says, Many Orthodox Jews simply do not trim their sideburns above this line. Other Jews, primarily Hasidic ones, go further with this tradition. They do not trim or cut their hair here at all. Rather, they allow it to grow indefinitely. The result is long side curls that visibly extend downward. You get about anything you want to ask on your iPhone. It's just unbelievable. Do Hasidic wives shave their hair? They go into that. What do Hasidics not allow to do? What do Hasidic Jews have? Two kitchens. One is for the uh, one is for the fruits and vegetables, and the other is for. Let me see here. It's for dietary laws which separate the meats and the dairies. When you get into their types of cooking. Why do Jews rock when they pray? <laughs> Everybody wants to know that. Why do they rock when they pray? According to mystical text Zohar, a person's soul emanates from divine light. Every time a Jew engages with the Torah, the light of his or her soul ignites, which is why he or she moves like the flame of a candle, which doesn't mean anything. And then it'll go on and give you why do Hasidic Jews wear the same clothes? Why do Jews wear furry hats? Why is meat and dairy not kosher? You get it all on your iPhone. You can't believe how much you can get on your iPhone. Just you can actually look at that before you write to me and you can't believe the amount of information you'll get. And that it goes on and on. I don't have time to go through all this. I better turn this off and then come back later. But that's enough said. If you got an iPhone, look at it. Just ask it questions and it will tell you. All right. 
Now let me get back to the other questions. Uh, sometimes I ask, I answer it through my iPhone. All right. And then, Cavett Hexenholz. This is a YouTube comment. Commented on Christmas is Christ Mass. It is Roman Catholicism. I am not a Roman Catholic. That was the title to one of my messages. Then he says, this joker's nuttier than a fruitcake. Yeah, and you're stupid because you don't believe God. Just another disciple of that crackpot, Hislop. Alexander Hislop was a member of the Free Church of Scotland, not free will, but free grace church. He believed in predestination. He was associate of the John Knox movement. You're ignorant or just stupid and you can't understand. There is no denying that many traditions and customs surrounding Christmas are derived from pre-Christian beliefs. Well, thank you for being smart on one point. And practices. Indeed, many of our present-day customs and traditions come from Christmas. You, you are so ignorant. The Bible says, Therefore shall you keep mine ordinance that you commit not any one of these abominable stinking customs. He didn't even say in that verse in Leviticus 30, 1831, he didn't even tell them not to serve their gods. He said, when you come into the land, don't even inquire of them how they serve their gods. You, you just, you act like you're stupid. Stupid is the word brutish. It means you can't learn. If you're that hard-headed, you can't. The candles you blow out for your birthday cakes, we don't celebrate birthdays have pre-Christian antecedents, but no one really seems to complain about those. You mean when they get drunk downtown at Christmas parties and men forsake their marriage vows to have a tryst with some little girl down there in some office party and she gets pregnant? That's no, that's no problem to that? And there's more people getting drunk, more booze are sold at Christmas time than any other time of the year. There's more car wrecks, more people killed and drunk and driving car wrecks. You act like you don't care. In fact, I'd be willing to bet, yeah, I'm sure what you're betting is going to be going to help, that very few people are even remotely aware of them. The point is the customs are vain. And they would do nothing but hurt you and kill you and destroy you. Well, you mean if you're supposed to go gather with some at some Christmas party with your kin folks and your sister-in-law cusses like a sailor and your brother-in-law tells dirty jokes and you're supposed to be in that middle of that? I don't believe in that at all. We don't go to any Christmas gatherings. Quite frankly, whether one wishes to acknowledge it or not, the paganness has been effectively bred out. You are an idiot, mister. Whoever you are, you're stupid. Hadn't been bred out. People are still getting drunk. I was checking every year on the monies that were spent at Christmas. From 1991 to 2001, in a 10-year period, there was 10... $11 billion spent on live Christmas trees. That's not counting the plastic Christmas trees. That's not counting That's not counting just the baubles that hang on the trees. It was up in the billions that they spent on that. The last count I took and looked on the Internet, over a trillion dollars was spent on Christmas. You buy one of those live Christmas trees, keep it in your den for a week or two, and then put it out by the garbage so the garbage men can haul off $11 million to the dump. You're stupid, mister, whoever you are. It's been bred out of Christmas. It hasn't been bred out, you ignoramus. And it's traditions for well over a thousand years, knucklehead. They have, for all intents and purposes, become completely Christianized. Oh, yeah? You mean all these drunks are Christianized? All this drunk driving is Christianized? 
all this spending money that people don't have. They go out and spend money and buy presents for people they don't even like in the family, that curse, and they're no more called Christians, and they don't know what to do about it. Don't do it. Like other pre-Christian customs and traditions, beware lest any men spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of this world and after, after the rudiments of this world and not after Christ that become a part of our culture. It's time to grow up and get over it. I don't know what to call you but a dumbbell. I can't insult you enough. You're stupid. You're saying that Christmas is safe. We had a guy fire our old song leader. He's had all kinds of strokes and heart attacks. But he was a fire inspector for Nashville Fire Department. He said every year Christmas trees kill hundreds of people in Nashville. Christmas tree fires. You're kind of dumb, you know that? You want to call me and talk to me about it, I won't be even this nice to you. You're going to say dumb things like this. I'm not going to say write us again, Mr. Hexenholtz. Chrissy Heavy commented on difficult verses, 70 weeks, spirits in prison, a sin unto death. Having had five kids, I understood the quickening as the start to life early in pregnancy. It's a thing women are aware of. The same as the Feast of Trumpets equals 18 weeks, which is when our embryos start to, to hear. So much of the Bible speaks in ways of pregnancy and birth. I've told you this many times, that sevens and Fours go together. Sevens and fours. A woman has 40 semesters, and that's the maturity of a baby. Mark 8 says that Jesus fed 7,000 or 4,000 with seven loaves of broken bread, four and seven. And Leviticus, the 26th chapter, you remember there were four judgments, sword, famine, pestilence, and the beast. And God says four times, I will punish you seven times for your sin. And he says it four times and mentions sword, famine, pestilence and beast seven and four you're going to find that all through the Bible you can't believe you don't believe in predestination you don't believe that God has really done the things that he's done in a mathematical fashion all right let me keep reading I hope that'll help you some Samuel Duodu D-U-O-D-U-U commented on doctrine of the devil, a parallel doctrine, smooth, easy words, accept Christ's sinner's prayer. I agree to a greater extent with what you're saying. However, how can you, a preacher, know that your audience have believed or the number of your audience who have been born of God? I don't know that. I preach to everybody. I don't know who's been born of God. When I go out in public, I witness every day to somebody. I look for a place to talk about Jesus and the Bible. I'm always looking for it. A lot of times before I walk in a grocery store, I say, Lord, if I haven't said something to these people in here, Lord, give me some words to say. And I'll make it simple, Lord, if you'll let me. I was checking out at Publix one day and and the checker, I knew the checker, and he said, How you doing today, Jim? I said, Oh, I'm doing the same as I was yesterday, and then I'll do the same tomorrow and the next day, and then I'll die one day, and I'll go to be with the Lord. And I just dropped it at that. And he went, 
She looked at me with big eyes. Didn't comment. I try to find a place to say something for Jesus every day. Now, let me... I don't know who's believer and who's not. I do not know who God's elect is. The hearing ear and the seeing eye, the Lord made even both of them. You cannot run off the elect with God's truth. You can't do it. It's kind of like... You think I can run my dog off with dog food? You can't run off sheep with sheep food. You give them sheep food and they'll start eating it. I don't worry about who believes and who don't believe. Boy, I have gotten free in my old age. I'll say anything at any time to anybody. My cardiologist said, you sure will be blunt about what you got to say. I said, why beat around the bush? The Bible says we're not supposed to do that. Seeing we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. Great is the word polis. It means often. As often as you talk, use parhesia. P-A-R-R-H-E-S-I-A. Parhesia comes from pos and areo. It means all, all of the word, something said. Just say it blunt to the point. I don't care if people get offended. They're supposed to. Majority of the world are vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. Many are going into the broad way. Few are going into the narrow way. It don't matter who they are. Just say the truth to them, blunt. If they don't like it, that's going to be their problem with God at the judgment. Not with you. Has nothing to do with you. All we are, you and I, all we are, we are a conduit. You know what a conduit is? It's just a hose. It's a hose or wire that carries the electrical current through the house. We're just a wire or or electrical hose. As whether the person comes alive or not doesn't have anything to do with the hose. It's whether we guide the water. The water is the Holy Spirit. If we guide it to where it's supposed to go, that's all. I used to get real nervous when I was young, afraid I was going to offend people. If I started to witness and I was about 22, my heart would go boom, 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 boom. <laughs> it don't do that anymore because I've got a thousand Bible verses and a thousand Greek words and I always just answer people with a Bible verse. When they say, well, how do you know? I don't know. I just tell everybody the truth about Jesus. That's all. You might be one of his and you may not be. And if you're not, you're going to get mad at me for saying Christmas is pagan and Easter is pagan and God doesn't love everybody. But you need to know that. Now, let me get on here. Dwayne Johnson, I guess that's the movie star, the man of sin, the head of the fire and tree worship, changing times and laws. Here's what he's got to say. So what about the Geneva Bible? I don't believe in any translations. None of them. What do you use? I use a King James Bible, but I go back to the Strong's Exhaustive Concordance then if I really want to know what a word is, I go back to the interlinear Bible that's got the original Greek text on the top line and it's got the English right under it. And I don't even agree with that English. I copy that Greek word down, look it up in one of my, my lexicons and find out if it's singular, plural, masculine, feminine, Jew, neuter, gender. That's what it'll say and it'll tell you. I won't know if it's first, second, or third person. I is first person. You is second person. They is third person. I want to know. I don't trust any translations. They they have men's signature on it. What about the Geneva Bible that the Reformers and Puritans used before the KJV? There was much persecution, apparently, to these two groups until they adopted the KJV. I don't really care about all those other Bibles. I want this original text. And I study it. I've been studying the original text of the Greek for about 43 years. Been studying the Hebrew for that long. 
All right, that's enough said. A biblical view commented on one baptism, 1580, Holy Spirit. I agree, brother, but what do we present to those who bring up the Gentiles receiving the Spirit and Peter asking, who can forbid water? That's not what he said in the original text. How do you know? I looked it up in the interlinear Bible. And then I looked up forbid. Forbid is not a verb saying forbid the water. It doesn't say that. It says not the water forbid. It is an infinitive. That is a noun. It is a verbal noun. It has verbal character. It means to block up, put a dam up where the water was. That's what it means. Whether anybody likes that or not, my father used to quote that when it dipped people in water. Boy, if I knew it then, I'd have said something as a teenager. I don't know if I would. I didn't have guts enough back then. But I'll say it now. doesn't say that. And then the next verse says, he commanded to be baptized in the name. To be baptized is also an infinitive, to be baptized. In the English language, you have to be in front of an infinitive. To be baptized in, that word in is e. In or I in. It doesn't mean to move into and come out of. When this word en is used with an infinitive, it only means with or by. How do you know that? Because I looked it up in Mr. Mounts, who is one of the foremost Greek authorities in the country. I looked it up in his book. See, I look up things. I want to know what does this mean? And it means to be baptized with. The name. Name is the word onoma. It means authority. Be baptized with God's authority. God's authority is his word. The word of God is the spirit of God. The Bible says in John 17, 17, thy word is a spirit. And the Holy Spirit is the word. And that's the authority we're baptized with. I don't know why I look these words up and none of the other preachers look them up. I want to know what does it mean? I don't believe in baptism, water baptism. Water baptism was a proselyte process that the Pharisees invented. The reason Jesus was washed in water because they kept calling him a Samaritan. And they said, if you're from Samaria, they wouldn't accept. Samaria was northern Israel. They said they wouldn't accept anything you said and wouldn't even go up there and talk to them. But they said if you would go through the proselyte process of being circumcised, washed in water, and offer two turtle doves at the temple, well, Jesus was circumcised on the eighth day. His mother had offered two turtle doves. All he had to do was wash in water. And they said they had to listen to him. He did it to say to the Pharisees, you have to listen to me according to your law now. Enough said. I can talk about that for hours. Bo Weevil writes, Bo Weevil writes and comments on Revelation, the purpose of the beast is for the good of Israel, causing them to repent in order to destroy the beast. What is the meaning of Revelation 2.9? 2, I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. You've got to remember, a Jew is not outwardly above the heart. Anybody that calls himself a Jew and they haven't been circumcised of the heart, look at Ephesians, the second chapter, Colossians, the second chapter. We're circumcised with a circumcision as Gentiles with a circumcision made without hands. I, I can talk about this for an hour, but I won't. All right, now. 
chords of gratitude right about revelation and and seven rainbow warble the iris the pupil eyes as a flame of fire take me about 10 hours to get started on that i did probably 15 messages on the eyes of the lord do you have a bible school or teaching website grace and truth dot net we've got about 2,000 messages on that i did four and a half years on the book of revelation you've never heard anybody teach revelation the way i do i define every word in the book every culture every custom every idiom revelation is a jewish book it's got the seven candlesticks in the first chapter and the seven candlesticks are the seven churches of asia where did the seven golden candlesticks start? You think maybe Exodus, the 25th chapter? That's Jewish, isn't it? And I could go all through Revelation and show you the Jewishness of the book. The 24 elders in the, elders in the fourth chapter, that's the 24 sons of Ithamore and all Eliezer. The two surviving sons of Aaron after God kills Nadab and Abihu for offering strange fire. Don't have time to go into that. I discovered I discovered everything you're talking about a decade ago, but most mainstream churches are not teaching this. I don't know of anybody that's teaching it. And I agree with you. Good for you. We appreciate it. And then I got a couple of emails. All right. J.C. in North Carolina. He writes to us all the time. Greetings, Pastor Jim and, fa and church family. I was reading about quotes by Augustine in this quote. Evil men do many things contrary to God's revealed will. I don't know if, I don't necessarily agree with every quote that comes up. But do so great is his wisdom. And so invoyable his truth that he directs all things in this one, those channels which he foreknew. I don't really understand that. Are you saying, Mr. Augustine? Augustine is supposed to be one of the champion fathers of the church a thousand years ago. No free will of the creature can resist the will of God. For man cannot so will or nil as to obstruct the divine determination or overcome divine power. I agree with that. It cannot be questioned, but God does all things and even did according to his own purpose. How can he state this concerning God's will? I don't know exactly what he meant. To be a Catholic priest... He was a Catholic. I believe he came out of the Catholic Church. It goes against their beliefs on free will. I think you got to remember, Martin Luther was a Catholic priest. He came out because of the doctrines of predestination and the way that they practiced their beliefs. He did not believe in free will. He did not believe in the indulgences. You could go to a priest on Monday night and you could pay uh, for you know you're going to go to this pub on Friday night where this good looking girl is and you're going to flirt with her and try to take her to bed or something, and you know she's there but you could pay for that indulgence on Monday for the coming Friday boy and that's why that's why Martin Luther nailed his 95 point thesis to the door of the church at Wittenberg Germany and that's why they took him before the before the council and and the and the king and the head of the Catholic Church and they thought they was going to kill him. Somehow he got away. I thank God for you and the ministry always agape my pastor and family. JC in North Carolina. We love you, JC. Keep writing. And then Deanna. Hello, Jim. Hey Deanna. I'm loving your preaching. I've been watching since the summer of this year. I have family who watch, and they have always wanted me to watch one of your videos 
and I never have until this past summer. I'm glad I did. I cannot stop watching. I learned uh, quite a bit from you. I hope so. <laughs> I appreciate the time you give to teach us what you know. I would love to get on DVD list. We'll put you on it. I have another question for you. Which one of the books of Encyclopedia of Religion shall I get? Well, if you've got internet, and you evidently do because you write us this email, you can go online and you can have your search engine search for McClinic and Strong Encyclopedia. That's as good as you can get. Just look up McClintock and Strong, Encyclopedia of Biblical, Ecclesiastical, and Theological Literature. I'm not sure which book I should be looking for. Thank you, Deanna. Give me a call. We'll talk about it. There's a lot of things you need. You need, if you can get those, if you can get this Encyclopedia of Religion by Hastings. Fantastic set of books. It's got a, an index volume with it. You can look for any subject you can think of. You want to look up swastika, you can look up that. How it was a Tibetan, of the Tibetan Buddhist worship. Hitler didn't invent that. It was a fire wheel. Anyway, so... I'll give you a few announcements. I'll, I'll do one other thing. I've been reading. I'll tell you what I'll do. Mary has been writing. She's been composing these books. And they're about quotes from... Quotes from famous preachers. And she calls it... Mary's collection of quotations. She's got book one, book two, and she's got book three she's working on right now. I think she's finished it up. And in the book three, it's got something I want to read to you. It's got this set of words. These are last words, a collection of the last words uttered at the edge of eternity. And these are the words of famous people. Steve Jobs. You know who Steve Jobs is. He's the guy that did all those. He was partners with uh, Bill Gates at one time. A brilliant mind. Steve Jobs, the driving force behind Apple, uttered this about three hours before his death, as reported by his sister, Mona Simpson. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. What a statement to make. Was he in pain? Did he reflect on his life? Did he see a vision? We'll never know. President George Washington. Doctor, I'm dying, but I'm not afraid to die. I don't know why he was not a Christian. He was a deist. He said he was. He said some crazy things. President Lincoln in Ford's Theater, speaking to Mrs. Lincoln, I'd like to visit the Holy Land. We could go to Jeru. At that point, Lincoln was shot by John Wilkes Booth. He died. Clarence Darrow. The Scopes trial lawyer in the famous 1925 debate, while on his deathbed, asked several clergymen to please intercede for me with the Almighty. During my life, I have spoken many times against Christians, and now I realize that I have been wrong. Whew. I don't care how much you don't believe God. Some of these men are smarter than anybody we know. Edward Gibbon, author of Rise and Fall of the Roman Empire. This was Mr. Gibbon's words. All is lost, irrevocably lost. All is dark and doubtful. John Wesley, preacher and songwriter. 
The best of all is that God is with us. Farewell, farewell. Marilyn Monroe, this is her last words. I don't need your Jesus related by Billy Graham who tried to present the gospel message to Marilyn just before she died at 36. I don't need your Jesus. That was Marilyn's last words. Michelangelo, famous painter and sculptor, I die in the faith of Jesus Christ and in the firm hope of a better life. Thomas Andrews, who designed the Titanic and drowned when it sank April 4th, 1912. No, not even God could sink the Titanic on its maiden voyage. I guess he got proved wrong, didn't he? He went down with the Titanic. David Brainerd, well-known missionary. I'm going into eternity, and it's sweet to me to think of eternity. Alexander the Great was an admirer of Socrates and Plato. Both were atheists. When he died, he threw a handful of blood at the sky in defiance of God. Tellerand called the most brilliant mind of his generation. Just because you're smart is not don't mean you're this smart. When asked about his condition while on his deathbed, he replied, I'm suffering the pangs of the damned. Whew. When you think you're an atheist, wait till you get to death. William Pitt, British statesman, I throw myself on the mercy of God through the merits of Jesus Christ. Joseph Stalin, Mr. Atheist, who murdered many millions of his own countrymen while on his deathbed, as related by his daughter, Svetlana, to Malcolm Muggeridge, he suddenly sat up, groaned, shook his fist at the ceiling, as if he could see beyond it, then fell back dead. Michael Faraday, Sir Michael Faraday, British-English scientist from 1791 to 1867, was asked when he was near death, what are your speculations now? He answered, I have no speculations. I rest upon Jesus Christ who died and rose again from the dead. Sir Francis Newport allowed his name to, to be used on a brand of cigarettes. We've seen the Newport as cigarettes. On his deathbed, he cried out, Oh, eternity, oh, eternity. He uttered a groan of unexpressible horror as he cried out, Oh, the insufferable pains of hell forever, forever. When you think you're tough, you're not. Not in face of God. Voltaire, one of the most famous atheists that ever lived, one of history's best-known atheists, often stated, by the time I'm buried, the Bible will be non-existent. His last words were, I am abandoned by God and man. I shall die and go to hell alone. That's where he went. His condition had become so terrible that his associates were afraid to approach his bedside. As he passed away, his nurse said that all of the wealth in Europe, she would never watch another infidel die. A few years after he died, the Geneva Bible Society purchased Voltaire's home and turned it into a print shop to print Bibles. Charles Adden Spurgeon, wonderful man of God, beloved preacher and author on his deathbed, said, I can hear them coming. He sat straight up in bed and asked, Don't you hear them? This is my coronation day. I see the chariots. I'm ready to board. Thank God for Mr. Spurgeon. Famous French author, 
guiding my passage, 1850 to 1893, of whom it was said, critics praised him, men admired him, women adored him. Before he went insane and died at early age 42, as a result of contracted syphilis, he penned his own epitaph. I have coveted everything, found pleasure in nothing. Boy, these, these things will sober you, won't they? Socrates was probably the most brilliant man of his millennium. The government of ancient Greece charged him with polluting the minds of the youth of his day and sentenced him to death. He drank poison to activate his sentence. He lay dying. His students asked him, is there life after death? His answer was, I hope so. I, I don't think I can read it. Let me read a couple of more. Julian the apostate, Roman emperor who hated Christians, was leading his forces in the battle for Persia, 363 A.D. He was mortally wounded, and as he lay dying on the battlefield, picked up some of his own blood, mingled with dirt, flung it skyward, and said, Thou hast conquered, O Galilean. The Galilean he's talking about was Jesus. Dwight L. Moody, famous preacher and founder of Moody Bible Institute. Wow, on his deathbed, can this be death? Why is it better than living? Earth is receding. Heaven is open. This is my coronation day. I'll read some more next time. That'll be enough for right now. And I will keep reading out of Mary's books. I wanted you to hear these about these men dying. When you think you're an atheist, like the old saying goes, there are no atheists in foxholes. You just think you're an atheist. Atheist comes from atheos. Theos is the word God. The alpha means no God. It means you don't believe in him. And agnostic means you don't know if there's a God. Same thing. All right. We are on TV around the country. We're canceling some of the TV. We're on in California. We're on in, uh, in uh, Los Angeles, San Diego, San Jose. We're on in San Francisco. We're on in TV up in Chicago, uh, up in uh, Oregon, in New York, in Brooklyn, Queens, Staten Island, Manhattan, the Bronx. We're on the, down the eastern seaboard, uh, Washington, D.C., Sh Charlotte, North Carolina, Charleston, South Carolina. We're on all over Texas. Dallas, Fort Worth, Houston, San Antonio, Austin, and we're on all over the Midwest, Kansas, and we're on all over the country. And uh, if you want us to stay on, you got to support us. We can't stay on if you don't support us. We answer questions that people write to us uh, on the internet, and we give money to some of the people there are we got about 25 people that we send money to and these are people that they're having a real hard time living we send money to Lloyd Nadab in Philadelphia Elizabeth Taylor in Dayton Ohio Sherry Johnson she's got a disease of the bones out in Tucson Connie Bonner, she's got ataxia. That's that's where her muscles give way and she can't breathe well. She said her mother died from this. We send money to Amanda Meadows in Murfreesboro. To Danielle Figpen, she's a paraplegic down in Louisiana. She's going through a program, a government program. Take 12 weeks to get through it. As soon as she gets through it, we have made an appeal for money from around the world. 
we brought in $90,000 to buy her a wheelchair accessible van. That money's in the bank. It is her money, and it's going towards her, this van. And then Robin Peters is in Amarillo, Texas. She's got leukemia. We send her 300 a month to help her with her bills. And then Patty Knight out in Bethany, Oklahoma, we send her money. And we send Eli, Eli Pratt out in North Hollywood, California, Robert Whistler in Ames, Iowa. And we send money to uh, Rebecca Rogers uh, in Loop, Texas, and Sharon Marshall down in Grand Prairie, and several other people. And these are people that need help. They're people that just, they just don't hardly have enough to live on. If you want to send money to one of these poor needy people, you make a check out to Grace and Truth Ministries. And you put on the bottom of the check, on the comments, X amount of dollars to the needy. You have to stipulate that and so much for your offering. The needy, I take it immediately and put it in the benevolent fund as soon as I get the letter from the bank. So none of that money that comes in for the needy goes into the operation funds for this ministry. It takes... If you want to give to this ministry, that's between you and God, not between me and you. Well, let's pray, and I'll give you a lesson, okay? Lord, thank you for the truth. Sometimes I don't know what to say. I just, I get, just, I've said everything I can say, but I'll keep repeating it, Lord, over and over. Just help us to know what to say and do. And I pray you'll convict the people's hearts to support the ministry. We need all the support we can get to continue doing what we're doing. We'll give you the praise. Fight our battles for us in Christ's name. Amen. I've got to get me a drink. D-R-A-N-K.
I'm Jim Brown, your Bible teacher here at Grace and Truth Ministries. I've been talking to you about Christmas. We don't believe in Christmas here. Christmas is Roman Catholicism. Now, eat flesh and drink blood is the Mass. Eat flesh. Eat flesh. And drink blood. is called the Mass of Roman Catholicism. But it is not the Mass. Eat flesh and drink blood was an ancient Jewish idiom. It was a saying, a figure of speech. It meant to partake in a slaughter. You'll find eat flesh and drink blood in the 39th chapter of Ezekiel where the Bible speaks of the end of time where Christ is coming back and he's going to destroy billions of people on the face of the earth and he's going to say to the carnivorous animals, the, the meat-eating animals, come and eat flesh and drink blood at the supper that I have prepared for you. He says the same thing in the 19th chapter of Revelation. He calls the fowls of the air when Christ comes back with eyes as a flame of fire in flaming fire taking vengeance on all those that know not God. There's going to be hundreds of millions of people, billions, dead across the face of the earth. He's going to call the fowls of the air, the wild beasts that are carnivores, to come and eat these flesh. Well, when the Bible says, Jesus said there in John, if you want to go with me over there to John, the sixth chapter, when you're looking at something, always notice what something is equal to. When he says, here in John 6, and he says, in John 6, he says, I am the bread of life in verse 48. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This bread which cometh down from heaven, he said, is him, and a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven, if any man eat this bread, he shall live forever, the bread. And the bread that I will give is my flesh. So the bread is the flesh. Equals, bread equals flesh. So when we eat flesh, we eat of the bread. And it's living bread. It's not literal bread. It's living bread. And he said, it's him. I am the living bread, which came down from heaven. And if any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. The bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, it was against Jewish law to eat human flesh and drink human blood. You have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh equals, it says he is, is is the same thing as equals. My flesh. We've already said it's the bread coming down from heaven. So the flesh equals meat. Indeed. Equals meat indeed. My blood equals. Equals drink indeed. All you have to do is define the word indeed and you know what eat flesh and drink blood is. It's the word alethes, A-L-E-T-H-E-S, which is a word that means of truth. But So we've got to define the word truth. 
Truth is the word A-L-E-T-H-E-I-A, which is a form of the word aletheia, and it comes from the word lanthano. So when you eat flesh, here's what you do. Lanthano means to hide or conceal. And the alpha, when it's in front of a word as a negative particle, it'll say, when you look it up in your concordance, it'll say from one, when you look up the word aletheia, one is the first thing in your concordance. It's an A. And it'll say from one, from the alpha, as a neg part. It means negative particle as a neg part. That means what it does. It negates the word lanthano and gives an opposite meaning. Same thing as atypical, which means not typical, or asexual, meaning not sexual, asexual, and anything that uses the alpha primitive, not sexual, so this means not to hide anything, not to conceal, and that's what I'm doing, defining this word for you, so everything that the flesh is, the Bible says that the flesh is the bread says that right here and Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10 1 Corinthians 10 16 and 17 he says he says when we drink the cup he says the cup of blessing in verse 16 cup of blessing which we bless, is communion of the blood of Christ. He's not talking about drinking literal blood. That's against Jewish law. Cup of blessing was the third cup of the Passover. Mr. Edersheim will tell you that in his book, The Ministry, The Temple, is Ministry and Services. He has a section, and it says right at the top, Cup of blessing, third cup of the Passover. He should know he was a Jew born in 1825, died in 1889. And he, he retained a lot of uh, cultural words in his books. So cup of blessing with the third cup of the Passover. And then he says in verse 17, We being many are one bread, and we are one body. We've already said the bread is the flesh, and the flesh is indeed, and all these things are equal to each other, so the bread is the body, and what is the body? How many bodies are there? What does eat flesh and drink blood actually mean? It has an exact meaning. When you look over there in Ephesians, look in Ephesians very quickly. In Ephesians, the fourth chapter, the Bible says, there is one body. Chapter 4, verse 4, one body, one spirit, Holy Spirit's truth, thy word is truth, and truth is when we eat we eat of the truth, we eat of flesh, or we eat of Christ. What does this actually mean? I'm going to show you what it actually means. And then you look over here in Colossians. Colossians, the first chapter. So we're talking about eating or partaking of the body of Christ. It's not the mass. It's not eating the literal body of Christ. And he says here in so when we eat of the flesh, we eat of the bread, we eat of the body. We partake of it. Then he says, in verse 18, speaking of Christ, he is the head of the body, the church. That's what we eat of. The body's the church. How do you eat of the church? In the Bible, when you 
eat of something, it does not necessarily mean to put something in your mouth and chew it. Doesn't mean that. And he says down here in verse 24 of Colossians 1, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. Now let me say something here that I haven't said. Every time it says my body, it doesn't say my body. It says te soma, S-O-M-A, the body, the feminine body. What is the feminine body? It's the wife, the bride, the church. Now, I want you to go with me over here to John 4. We're talking about what does it mean to eat of the body. Look here in John 4. Jesus is talking to the woman at the well of Samaria. And the apostles are there and they say, we're going to go into town and get something to eat. And then when they come back and here in the woman left her water pot in verse 28 and went her way into the city, saith to the men, Come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came unto him. And in the meanwhile, his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. But they went to get some food in town. And he said unto the apostles, I have a meat to eat that you know not of. And here's my meat. Let me tell you what my meat is. Therefore said the disciples one to another, Hath any man brought him any food? And Jesus said unto them, My meat is to do. My meat. is to do the will of the Father. That is our meat. In fact, the word law is the word nomos in the Greek, and it means legally prescribed food for animals, and in our case, sheep. Our food is the law. That's what we eat of. Now, all right. I want to continue on this. And he said, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. That's my meat. It's not something I chew. It's something I do. He that doeth truth cometh to the light. He that doeth truth is eating of the word of God or eating of the body of Christ. Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. Now, what does it mean to eat of the body? It doesn't mean the Christ mass. That is, those Roman Catholics have made up this formula. Hoc est corpus eum fully. Hoc est corpus. This is my body, my corpse. Hum, meum, m e u m, fully. This is my body. That's what it says in the Latin. And they say, where did they get that magic formula from? They made it up. It's not, the Bible doesn't say that anywhere. You eat the literal body of Christ. What do you do, go up, walk up to him, and take a bite out of his arm? You really want to know what eating the body of Christ. Turn to the 12th chapter of 1 Corinthians. 
This is going to tell you all about eating of the body. Notice how all these things tie together. Go to 1 Corinthians 12. And when you eat of the body, you partake in the body as God hath set everyone in the body. Now he says here, I'll read a little bit of this so you can understand it. He starts off and says, everyone has a gift in the body of Christ. Concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, the gift is while you eat in the body. It's what your ability is. Is it in computers? Is it playing the piano? Is it uh, sweeping the floor? Is it working and delivering things? Whatever your ability is, that is your gift in the body. Is one to be lifted up above another? No. Concerning spiritual gift, I would not have you ignorant. You know that ye were Gentiles carried away unto these dumb idols, even as ye were led. Wherefore, I give you to understand, understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord. Now, when Kenneth Copeland says Jesus is Lord, he doesn't believe that. Lord is the word kurios. It means he rules your life. And when Kenneth Copeland tells lies about Jesus, then he's not, he's not the Lord of Kenneth Copeland. There's no such thing as Pentecostal tongues when he gets to go and shandala manda kanda shanda mandala shandala makachika. That is a baloney. Kenneth Cope, when you're alive, you're going to go to hell. God's going to wind you up with a big right hand and cast you into hell about a thousand miles an hour. I do not believe you can lie about God's word for 40 years and be one of God's elect. You can kill people like Paul did. You can murder somebody like David did. But God hates a liar more than he hates anything, especially when you lie about him and his word. And then he says, Now therefore there are diversities of gifts. These gifts are how you partake in the body of Christ, how you eat of the body. In fact, I'm going to show you how it actually says eat of the body later in this chapter. And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities, the orthoses, distinction, variety of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all things in all people in all the church. Everybody can't be the preacher. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. To one is given by the Spirit of God, word of wisdom, and another. Now this next, this end of this sentence is something that Pat Robertson has twisted all two pieces. It said a word of knowledge it doesn't just say a word of knowledge. It says by the same Spirit. The Holy Spirit is truth. John 14, 15, 16, John 15, 26, John 16, 13, 1 John 5 and 6. The Spirit is the truth. And truth is aletheia. It means to remove the cover, A-L-E-T-H-E-A, not to hide anything. You don't hide nothing. That's what the Spirit is. So you got a word of knowledge, gnosis, G-N-O-S-I-S. That would be our word science or knowledge. And Pat Robertson says, he bows his head and says, there's somebody out there, he calls this a word of knowledge. Someone is out there and they got a pain somewhere in in uh, their kidney or in their 
and their uh, uh, one of their inner uh, workings of their body. No, knowledge is something that's exact. It's not, perhaps it's somewhere in your stomach. That's not a word of knowledge. A word of knowledge is by the same truth, you ignoramus. Pat Robertson is one of the dumbest guys I have ever seen on TV in my life. They, they had a question-answer period one time, and this one guy looked very dignified. He stood up and had his three-piece suit on and said, Brother Pat, I'd like to ask you a question. Did Jesus go down to hell to preach to the spirits in prison? Pat Robertson starts breaking out in sweat on his forehead. Boy, he doesn't want to be asked that. Spirits in prison are the Gentiles that were in darkness. Prison means the division of day and night or light and darkness. And the spirits in prison were the Gentiles who had no truth for a 4,000-year period from Adam until Jesus. That's the spirits in prison. And Pat Robertson, here's how he answered that question. He said, uh, 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 yes, uh, uh, Jesus went to the gates of hell and he said, Everyone in the Old Testament wants to come out of hell, you can come out. And there were some guys down there in the depths of hell saying, we'd like it here, we're getting a good suntan here. <laughs> what an idiot. What, how stupid can you be? I'd rather just say, I can't answer that rather than the way he made this thing up and said stupidity. Prison Fulake means the division of day and night are light and darkness. And we were darkness, but now we light in the Lord. We're to walk as children of light. And light is what you predestined to. Predestinate is pro horizo, O-R-I-Z-O. And horizo is our word horizon. It means to predetermine for the light or to bring from darkness to light and bring a person out of prison. Bring him out of darkness. That's the spirits in prison. It was the Gentiles. You nimble brain. I would like to tell that guy off if I saw him in public. So you one of the stupidest people I've ever heard talk on TV. And those people just suck that stuff in. Stupid. Can you imagine going to the gates of hell open up the door and say everybody that wants to come out of hell can everybody says well I, we want to come Napoleon wants to come and Jeffrey Dahmer wants to come and all these killers want to come and Hitler wants to come out and so he lets them all come out how dumb anyway we're talking about the gifts partaking of the body of Christ so we go on down here. I'm, he says, for the one is given. These are the gifts that you can eat of the body of Christ. One is given by the same truth, the spirit, the word of wisdom. And to another, word of knowledge. Knowledge comes through study year after year after year after year after year. It's not some spiritual thing where you're going to heal somebody. you got a pain here. That's, that's stupid. And the same spirit, another faith by the same spirit, another the gifts of healing. That's not going on now. To another working of miracles, those are gone. To another prophecy, another discerning of spirits. To another diverse kinds of tongues, glossa, foreign languages. And he goes on down. Now look down here. I want to get on with this. Then he says in verse 13, By one spirit are we all baptized into the one body we're going to eat of. Right? Eating of the body is eating of the flesh. The flesh is the body. The body is the bread. This is very idiomatic language. It's idiom. It's metaphors. Whether we use our Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been made to drink into one spirit, one truth. When you find the spirit is truth in one place, it's the truth everywhere else. It's just simply taking the cover off. 
For the body is not one member, but many. Fingers, arm, head, neck. Uh, when you have your insides, you found, we have found that the things that we used to think were necessary parts of our body are. We found that the appendix was necessary. It gathers poison. We found that the tonsils, when I was young, all the other young guys were having their tonsils removed. When I went out on the road to sing, I had my tonsils removed at about 24, and the infection went from my tonsils to my lungs. That's what happens. And I've got bronchial asthma. So the parts you think are not important Try to walk without your toenails. You'll be bumping into stuff going, oh, oh, oh. You'll be getting stone bruises all day long without your toenails. You have to have them. You have to have your big toes and your thumbs. When they would catch a king in the Old, Test Old Testament times, they would cut off his great toes and his thumbs. He couldn't ever hold a weapon anymore, and he couldn't get his balance. Therefore, he couldn't raise up an army to go and conquer this king anymore. That's two things they would do. Cut his thumbs off, cut his great toes off, and the guy was useless. You have to have him. Now, then he says, here's how you're eating of the body of Christ. He says here in verse, let's read verse 13 again. For by one spirit are one baptized in one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been made to drink into one spirit, for the body is not one member, but many. You got fingers, you got toes, you got feet, you got ears, you got eyes, you got all these parts of your body, you got legs. Those are part of the body. And he uses a literal body to express this with. If the, the body is not one member of many, if the foot shall say, because I'm not of the hand, I'm not of the body, does that make him not of the body? Is the foot as important as the hand? Absolutely. Is it therefore not of the body? If the ear shall say, we're talking about how you eat of the body of Christ as of John 6 chapter. And if the ear shall say, because I'm not of the eye, I'm not of the body. The, do you need your ear? If you don't have your ears, you have no balance. You'll be stumbling all over the place. Your ears give you balance. And if the whole body were an eye, where's the hearing? You got to have your eyes to see where you're going, but you got to have your ears to have balance. Have you ever noticed when you get sick and you lose your balance? I got, uh, what do you call it? Uh, vertigo. Vertigo. I got vertigo. I couldn't get up out of bed. And I just stumbled around. I said, Mary, I can't even walk. It was one year, two or three years ago. I couldn't even walk, couldn't even stand up. But it had to do with my ears. If the whole were hearing, where's the smelling? So we're talking about how do you eat of the body of Christ? It's not Christ's mass. But how hath God set the members, every one of them in the body, as it hath pleased him? I've had so many young men come here, say, when you die, I'm going to take over. You can't take over. We are a corporation. Let me tell you what happened. My father came over here about 1992. I'd already started this as a Bible class in my basement. And I didn't know it was going to grow into a church all over America. And uh, my father said, I've got a little church in Memphis. 
and we are a corporation over there. We can transfer those. We can transfer those papers over here. So he came over here, and he went to uh, went down to the building downtown, a government building, and they transferred the Heritage Baptist Church Corporation to Grace and Truth Ministries. And then he said to me, and this is something my family doesn't know. He said to me. I've got a little house church in Memphis, and when I die, that whatever that house church brings, it will come to Grace and Truth Ministries and go into your building fund. And that's exactly what I did with $25,000 that when he sold that house, then he sent that to this church, and I put in there a building fund, and it's still there. I believe that's why when my mother and father died, my younger brother didn't give me any, any, not one thing out of my mother and father's uh, inheritance. Not one thing. And he thinks, you got that 25000 No, the church got that, Dodo. I didn't get any of it. And it's still there. And if it's not used to build a building, it'll be used to run this ministry after I'm dead and gone. So you don't know what you're doing, little brother. And they didn't like it because I didn't go to my mother's and father's funeral because he was there. My little brother's a con and a crook. And I don't care if he sees this. I hope he does. All right. Enough said about that. Now, every member is put in the body. I'm the preacher here. I've had young guys say, when you leave, I'll take over. No, you won't. First of all, I'm the president of the corporation. My wife is the vice president. Eric and Mike, when my father came over here, that was all that was here was Eric, my son, and Mike. So they're the officers of the corporation. You're going to have to get my wife and Eric and Mike to vote for you if you take over. And I doubt seriously if they'll vote in. These young guys says, I'm going to take over. You can't. That's kind of like, Ben lives across the street from me, and if Ben dies, that's like me going across the street and saying, okay, Holly, his wife, I'm taking over your house. Ben died. <laughs> you can't do that. I don't know why these guys would think that. Now, I want to show you what eating the body of Christ is, okay? Now, he says here, if they were not one member, where were the body? But now are they many members, verse 20, but one body, fingers, arms, hands, elbows, shoulders, belly, uh, appendix, tonsils, and the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, let me put it this way. The piano player can't say to the custodian, I have no need of these. She'll have to play the piano in the dirt. Nor again the head to the feet. I have no need of thee. Nay, much more those members of the body, the church. Every time you see body, think church. Think you're going to eat of the church, a portion to eat of or partake of which seem to be more feeble, are necessary. Every part of the body, isn't it? Your toenails are necessary. If you didn't have your fingernails, you'd be bumping them all the time and getting stone bruises all day long. You're going, well, i got to quit touching things. you got to have your fingernails. you got to have your toenails. That's important. Why do you think God designed our bodies the way he did? And now those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor. And our uncomely parts, uncomely, asthenes means they don't fit well. They're not handsome. They don't have a real quick reply. They're not real glib. And they're not funny. And they're not real talented. But they're uncomely, and we give them more honor than the rest of the parts of the body of Christ. 
for our comely parts have no need. Comely means they fit easy. Maybe they're real popular. We uh, used to have a guy come here, Jim Reynolds. Jim was very glib. You could say something, he'd have a real quick comeback. Very talented, played the piano and played the, played the guitar and sang. And he had a lot of talent. He was a chiropractor, and very educated. And I told him one time, I said, you don't need any more attention. You get all the attention you need. He said, you're right. I said, we need to take these people that don't have the attention and after church go around and pat them on the back and say, how are you doing? Give them more attention. Because that's our place where we eat of the body. I'm going to show you that. But God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked, that there should be no schism, no division in the body or in the church, that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all members suffer with it. When somebody's having a hard time, we've got to go out of our way to pick them up. Or one member be honored, all members rejoice with it. And look at verse 27. This will tell you how you eat of the body. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. The word particular is the word meros. It means a portion to eat of. Portion. This is how we eat of the body. It's not the mass. The mass is idiocy. Evidently, the Roman Council of Heaven never studied this. A portion to eat of. Look over here in Luke. Go to Luke. You want to know what it means except you eat my flesh and drink my blood. You eat and drink of truth. You eat and drink of the bread of life. You eat and drink of the body, which is the church. It has nothing to do with the mass of Roman Catholicism. You go over here to look at the 24th chapter. Jesus is resurrected from the dead. And he's been crucified earlier in the book. And he resurrects from the dead. He goes to northern Galilee where the apostles are in a house. And the doors are all shut and he walks through the wall and he appears to them. Oh, wait. How can, what do you think of that? He just all of a sudden appears to the apostles. And then he says to them, And while they yet, verse 41, While they yet believed not for joy and wondered, he said unto them, Have you any meat to eat? And they gave him a piece of fish. The word peace is the word meros. That's amazing, isn't it? We are members in particular. We eat of the body, but we don't partake of the sacrament of the mass. That's not what that's about. It's talking about eating of the body. Oh, by the way, when you place the alpha in front of meros, it negates the word and it translates A M A R T I A. Hamartia is the word sin. It means unlawful food. Where did that start? In the garden. God says you can eat of all these trees outside the midst of the garden, but you can't eat of that tree in the middle of the garden. That's unlawful. That's amorous. That's sin. Well, what was in the tree? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. Those are the three things that Eve saw in the tree. A tree that's good for food. It was pleasant to the eye. And it would make her wise and she could be proud in her own conceits. And that's the three wishes of the genie or the three wishes of the demon. 
to distribute all that to her. You can eat all of these trees out of here. By the way, the word iniquity is the word anomia. A-N-O-M-I-A. That's the word iniquity in the Greek. And iniquity comes from nomos and the alpha primitive. It means no lawful food. It means stay away from the tree in the garden. That's what it means. Uh, we have just... I don't know why I can find these things in preachers. You know what it is? They don't believe in studying details. They have come up and invented the Christ's mass. It has nothing to do with Jesus. It's Roman Catholicism. I got a, something here. I, I read it every year. And Christmas is Christ's mass. It was against the law to celebrate Christmas 300 years ago in America. There was a reason for that. I'll tell you that in a minute. I wrote this, this prayer. I wrote this years ago. It's called Jesus, You Wouldn't Mind. I read this every year. It's a prayer I wrote that we pray to Jesus. And it reads this way. Jesus, I know you told us the customs of the heathen are vain and not to learn the way of the heathen. Not to learn the way. The way is narrow. And I know that you told us that philosophy, which comes from philos, which means affection, for Sophia or Sophos, wisdom of men, the love of wisdom, vain deceit, and traditions of men and the rudiments of this world will spoil us and lead us into captivity or into darkness if we follow these traditions. I know you said that, Jesus. And Jesus, I realize you told us not to add or diminish from your word in Deuteronomy 4, 1 and 2. You said don't add or diminish from your word. And I know you said that your word is unchangeable in Malachi 3.6. But you won't mind if we keep a drunken festival in your honor as long as we change the name so it sounds kind of Christian. We change it from Christ Mass to Christmas and drop one of the S's. You don't mind that, do you, Jesus? Even if it is fire worship, you won't mind, will you? Now, Jesus, we're not going to be able to stop the drunks and the pagan worshipers from continuing to keep their ancient customs, and there'll be a, still be a record number of suicides this time of the year, and the poor will feel oppressed. The poor can't participate in it. They got no money. But, We'll take them a dinner at Xmas time and tell them, we'll be back next year. We hope you can make that last all year long, okay? And Jesus, there will be a record number of wrecks from drunk drivers, and the liquor stores will be thrilled to see the season come. And Playboy puts out a special Christmas edition. Doesn't that make you happy, Jesus? Adultery will run rampant as husbands and wives abandon their vows at parties. And you'll be really happy when you hear my idea, Jesus. We're going back in history and found fire worshipers of the ancient world who had a festival that started on December the 17th and ended on December the 25th, the birthday of their fire god, Hercules, or Mithra, or Nimrod, whatever you want to call him. And they worship their pagan gods. Jesus, here's my idea. I got a great idea. We're going to take this drunken festival they call the Festival of Saturn, or the Saturnalia, and we're going to put your name on it. And we'll call it the Christ Mass. We'll drop an S to disguise it, okay? 
They offered their children in the fire and ate them. But I assure you, Jesus, that even though most of the world will be celebrating this festival the same way they've done thousands of years before you were born, I want you to believe me when I tell you that we won't do it that way. And when they ask us why we're dragging the church into doing something so evil, I'll tell them we don't do it that way. We're using paganism to glorify God. It was an ancient orgy. Jesus, doesn't that make you happy? You don't mind, do you? After all, Preachers say it's okay as long we use as we use this pagan festival to spread the gospel. If they say it, you won't mind, will you? I promise Jesus, we're not going to keep the customs of the heathen like they kept them. We're going to keep them different. You won't mind if we do this, will you, Jesus? If you want a copy of that, I've got a bunch of them down here. Christmas is hellish. It's a drunken festival. I have looked up. I haven't looked up in several years. Maybe I'll do it this year before the season's over. But it's just something that has no redeeming qualities whatsoever in it. Liquor sales goes through the roof between when you start in in September or at the end of August all the way through the end of the year. It was a drunken festival. That's what it was. It was not nothing Christian about it. It's still the same drunken festival. Just take a ride on December the 25th or somewhere around New Year's Eve, down here around these nightclubs in Nashville, they're packed full and the people are drunker than skunks. I don't care what people say. It is one of the biggest lies. Now, why was Christmas outlawed in early America? Why was it? I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to read some from Fox's Book of Martyrs. I've read from this at times. Christmas time is the time to read Fox's Book of Martyrs. When the Puritans came over here, actually before they came, let me erase this, before they came to America, they were families in Europe. And these families believed in predestination. They did not believe in the mass. And the, the popes, and particularly the Roman Catholic Church, under, under the Dominicans, They have different orders of the Roman Catholic Church. The Dominicans started this persecution of the church, and they call these the Catholic Inquisition, the Roman Catholic, I should say Roman Catholic, Inquisition. Inquisition comes from the word inquisitive. What they did, they would set up a military group of men. At that time, back in the 1600s, 1500s, 1400s, the Pope had an army, and he had them go out and conquer people. They would actually hire local thugs to go out there and torture the people. And these, when you see the at, the, at Christmas season, and you see the, the, those guards of the Pope, the Swedish guards, 
Swedish guards. Swiss guards, excuse me, not Swedish, Swiss. See the Swiss guards. And you'll see them and you'll be able to recognize them. They'll have these puffy uh, right above their legs. It's puffy and then their body will be up here. It's just a big round puff. Those were supposed to be killers back during when the Pope wanted his army. And they were literally like having an army of of uh, killers they had they knew how to use weapons of all kinds and they guarded the pope he would actually send these armies out and he would have send them out at these inquisitions they had the roman catholic inquisition the portuguese I don't know if that's the way he spelled it. Portuguese Inquisition. They had the medieval Inquisition. Inquisition. And they would send men out to torture. To torture people in a village over here. And they would threaten, if you will not renounce your, your Protestant beliefs and partake of the sacrament of the Mass... We will torture you. We'll kill your children in front of you. We'll pull your arms off. They would put a man, they would put his his leg and one arm tied to a horse on this side and out of the other side, and they would start pulling him until his body would split and come to pieces. They did every kind. They would cut the breasts off a woman, cut her legs off, put a stob up her bottom, set her out in the field to just let her languish and die. And that's why I hate Christmas. When, the, when these families came to America, the Albigans family, the Albigans, the Waldens, the Cathars, and other families when they came to, before they came to America, they pulled together all over Europe and England and other families and, and the Huguenots, probably pronounced Huguenot because it's French word, and most of the Huguenots settled in France area here, in France, here. And they had Huguenots everywhere. These families were tortured and persecuted and killed and, and just destroyed. I've got some. Here's why I hate Christmas. Because of Fox's Book of Martyrs will tell you all about what they did to them. It says here, Pope Paul, I'm going to just read some of these sections out of the two, out of the uh, Fox's Book of Martyrs. Pope Paul III was a bigoted papist. That means he was with the papacy, which has to do with Papa the Pope. Pope means Papa or Father. Ascending the pontifical chair, we've talked about that. Immediately, that's where that Mel Gibson said he'll vote with the chair because he was a Roman Catholic immediately solicited the Parliament of Turin to persecute the Waldenses as the most pernicious of all heretics. The Parliament readily agreed when several were suddenly apprehended and burnt by their order. Among these was Bartholomew Hector, a bookseller, a stationer of Turin, who was brought up a Roman Catholic, but having read some treatises written by the Reformed clergy, was fully convinced of the errors of the Church of Rome. Yet his mind was for some time wavering, and he hardly knew what persuasion to embrace. At length, however, he fully embraced the Reformed religion and was apprehended, as we have already mentioned, and burnt by order of the Parliament of Turin. 
A consultation was now held by the Parliament of Turin in which it was agreed to send deputies to the valleys of Piedmont with the following proposition. that Number one, that if the Waldenses would come to the bosom of the Church of Rome and partake of the sacrament of the Mass and embrace the Roman Catholic religion, they should enjoy their houses, properties, and lands and live with their families without any of the least molestation. That to prove their obedience, they should send 12 of their principal persons with all their ministers and schoolmasters to Turin to be dealt with at discretion. That the Pope, the King of France, the Duke of Savoy, approved of and authorized the proceedings of the Parliament of Turin upon their occasion. That if the Waldenses of the Valleys of Piedmont refused to comply with the propositions, persecution should ensue and certain death to be their portion. All you have to do is embrace the Catholic Church and you're safe. Take of their mass, refute all of your Protestant beliefs. To each of these propositions, the Waldenses nobly replied in the following manner, answering them respectively, that no consideration whatever should be made them renounce their religion, that they would never consent to commit their best and most respectful friends to the custody and discretion of their worst, most inveterate enemies, that they valued the approbation of the king of kings who reigns in heaven more than the temporal authority, that their souls were precious to their bodies, more precious than their bodies, these pointed and spirited replies greatly exasperated the Parliament of Turin. They continued with more avidity than ever to kidnap such Waldenses as they did act with proper precaution who were sure to suffer the most cruel deaths. Among them, it unfortunately happened that they got hold of Jeff Jeffrey Vernagel, minister of, of Anne Gron, whom they committed to the flames as a heretic. They then solicited the considerable body of troops of the king of France in order to exterminate the reformed entirely from the valley of Piedmont. But just as the troops were going to march, the Protestant princes of Germany interposed and threatened to send troops to ascend the Waldenses. <clears throat> if they should be attacked, the king of France, not France is a Roman Catholic country, not caring to enter into a war, remanded the troops and sent word to the Parliament of Turin that he should not spare that he should not spare any troops at present to act in Piedmont. After the Waldenses had enjoyed a few years of tranquility, they were again disturbed by the following means. The Pope's nuncio coming to Turin to the Duke of Savoy upon business told that, pri that prince he was astonished he had not yet rather rooted out the Wallenses from the valleys of Piedmont entirely or compelled them to enter into the bosom of the Roman church. Stung by this reflection and unwilling to misrepresent to the Pope, the Duke determined to act with greatest severity in order to show his zeal and make amends for former neglect by future cruelty. He accordingly issued express orders for all Waldenses to attend Mass regularly on pain of death. This they absolutely refused to do, on which he entered the Piedmont Valley with a formidable body of troops and began the most furious persecution in which great numbers were hanged, drowned, ripped open, tied to trees, 
pierced with prongs, thrown from precipices, burnt, stabbed, racked to death. This is what the Catholic Church did. That's why when they came to America, they changed their names to Puritans, said we will purify this land of all papal influences. And they outlawed Christmas and Easter and anything that was Roman Catholic. Some Roman Catholic ruffians having seized a minister as he, as he was going to preach, determined to take him to a convenient place and burn him. His parishioners having intelligence of this affair, the men armed themselves, pursued the ruffians, and seemed determined to rescue their minister, which the ruffians no sooner perceived than they stabbed the poor gentleman, leaving him weltering in his blood and made a precipitate retreat. The astonished parishioners did all they could to recover him, but in vain, for the weapon had touched the vital parts, and he expired. He died as they were carrying him home. The monks of Pickerel, these are monks of the Roman Catholic Church, having a great inclination to get the minister of the town in the valleys called St. Germain in their power, hired a band of ruffians for the purpose of apprehending him. These fellows were conducted by a treacherous person who had formerly been a servant to the clergyman and who perfectly well knew a secret way to the house by which he would lead them without alarming the neighborhood. The guide knocked at the door and being asked who was there, answered in his own name. The clergyman, not expecting any injury from a person on whom he had heaped favors, immediately opened the door, but perceiving ruffians, he started back and fled to the back door, and they rushed in, followed and seized him. Having murdered all of his family, they made him proceed towards Pignero, goading him all the way with pikes, lances, and swords, all because he would not partake of the sacrament of the Mass, the Christ Mass. This is why the Puritans said, no more Christmas. He was kept a considerable time in prison and then fastened to the stake to be burnt when two women of the Waldenses who had renounced their religion to save their lives were ordered to carry faggots. The faggots were the green limbs that they put around the, around the place where they're going to burn them to the stake to burn him I'm sure homosexuals got their name from this. As they laid them down to say, take these, thou wicked heretic, in re recompense for the pernicious doctrines thou hast taught us. These words they both repeated to him, to which he calmly replied, I formerly taught you well, but you have since learned ill. The fire was then put to the faggots, and he was speedily consumed, calling upon the name of the Lord as long as his voice permitted. A young Englishman, a young Englishman who happened to be at Rome, was one day passing by church when the procession of the host was coming. The host was the cookie, the Roman Catholic cookie. A bishop carried the host, which the young man perceiving, he snatched it from him, threw it to the ground and trampled it under his feet, crying out, you wretched idolaters. They idolized that cookie because they said it had the body and the blood of Christ in it, and they paraded it through the streets and bowed to it. He said, you wretched idolaters who neglect the true God, to adore a morsel of bread. This action so provoked the people that they, had, they would have torn him to pieces on the spot, but the priest persuaded them to let him abide by the sentence of the Pope. When the affair was 
represented to the Pope, he was so greatly exasperated that he ordered the prisoner to be burnt immediately. The Pope did. But a cardinal dissuaded him from this hasty sentence, saying that it was better to punish him by slow degrees, to torture him, that that might find it had been instigated by any particular person to commit so atrocious an act. This being approved, he was tortured with the most exemplary severity, notwithstanding which he could only get these words from him. It is the will of God that I should do as I did. The Pope then passed sentence upon him. Then he should be led by the executioner naked to the middle of the streets of Rome that he should wear the image of the devil upon his head and that his breeches should be painted with the representation, representation of flames, that he should have his right hand cut off, that after having been carried about thus in procession, he should be burnt. This is what the Catholics did to these families that would not partake of the sacrament of the Mass. They tortured them and killed them pulled their fingernails out, stripped their skin off, said, recant. They said, no. When he heard his sentence pronounced, he implored to God to give him strength and fortitude to go through it. If that happens to us, can you ask God, give me strength to go through it? As he passed through the streets, he was greatly derided by the people to whom he said some several things respecting Romish superstition. But a cardinal, that's the guys with the red hats and so forth, cardinal who, who attended the procession overhearing him ordered him to be gagged. When he came to the church door where he trampled on the host, the hangman cut off his right hand and fixed it on a pole. That's the hand he used to, to, to curse, the, to stomp the Eucharist. Then two tormentors with flaming torches scorched and burnt his flesh all the rest of the way. At the place of execution, he kissed the chains that would bind him to the stake. A monk Presenting the figure of a saint to him, he struck it aside, then being chained to the stake, fire was put to the faggots, and he was soon burnt to ashes. A little after the last mentioned execution, a venerable old man who had been a prisoner in the Inquisition was condemned to be burnt and brought out for execution. When he was fastened to the stake, a priest held a crucifix to him. Crucifix has Christ hanging on the cross. That's Roman Catholic. On which he said, if you do not take that idol from my sight, you will constrain me to spit upon it. The priest rebuked him for this with great severity, for he forbade him to remember the first and second commandment and refrain from the idolatry. As God himself had commanded, he was then gagged that he should not speak any more. and fire being put to the faggots, he suffered martyrdom in the flames. Can you imagine burning in the flames? One man, they said, the faggots were green and they wouldn't really burn and said they would just smoke, and it started cooking his body, and the bubbles would come out, and the juices would come out. And they said, this man said with a loud voice, for God's sake, folks, give me more fire. <sighs> Can you imagine that? Let me read one more to you. This armed multitude being encouraged by the Roman Catholic bishops and monks fell upon the Protestants in a most furious manner. Nothing now was to be seen but the face of horror and despair. 
they're out here in an open field in some there's nothing but dirt roads and dirt streets. And they've got people out here in the fields and they're killing them and torturing them and pulling their skin off of their body. Nothing now was to be seen but the face of horror and despair. Blood stained the floors of the houses. Dead bodies bestrewed the streets. Groans and cries were heard from all parts. Some armed themselves and skirmished with the troops, and many with their families fled to the mountains. In one village they cruelly tormented 150 women and children after the men were fled, beheading the women, dashing out the brains of the children in the towns of Valerio and Bobbio, most of those who refused to go to the mass, who were afterwards of 15, who were upwards of 15 years of age, they crucified with their heads downward. Can you imagine that? Less than 15 years old. The greatest number of those who were under their age were strangled. Sarah Ristogone de Vignes a woman of 60 years of age, being seized by some soldiers, they ordered her to say a prayer to some saints, which she refusing, they thrust a sickle into her belly and ripped her open, then cut off her head. This is what the Catholic Church has done in these inquisitions. Is there any wonder that the Puritans said, we won't have that here anymore. Let me read a little more. Two old women were ripped open and then left in the fields upon the snow where they perished. And a very old woman who was deformed had her nose and hands cut off and was left to bleed to death in that manner. A great number of men, women, and children were flung from the rocks and dashed to pieces. Magdalene Bertino, a Protestant woman of La Torre, was stripped naked, stripped stark naked, her head tied between her legs, and thrown down one of the precipices. And Mary, Ray, Mary Raymond of the same town had the flesh sliced from her bones until she expired. Magdalene Pilate of Valerio was cut to pieces in the cave of Castellos. Anne Carbonier had one end of a stake thrust up in her body and the other being fixed on the ground. She was left in this manner, left in this manner. Well, I didn't get the... She was left in this manner and to die. Magdalene, the daughter of Peter Fontaine, a beautiful child of 10 years of age, was ravished, raped, and murdered by the soldiers. Another girl of about the same age, they roasted alive at Villanova, and a poor woman hearing that the soldiers were coming toward her house, snatched up the cradle in which her infant son was asleep and fled toward the woods. The soldiers, however, saw and pursued her, and when she lighted herself by putting down the cradle and child, which the soldiers no sooner came to than they murdered the infant and continuing to pursue and found the mother in a cave where they first ravished and raped her and then cut her to pieces. This is what the Catholic Church did in the Inquisition. Is there any wonder the Puritans said, we'll purify this land of all Roman Catholic influences? Does it affect you like it affects me? I hate Christ's Mass. I hate it with a passion. Jacob Bjorn a schoolmaster of Rorada, for refusing to change his religion, was stripped quite naked, and after having been in, indecently exposed 
had nails of his toes and fingers torn off with red hot pinchers, the holes bored through his hands with the point of a dagger. He then had a cord tied around his middle and was led through the streets with a soldier on each side of him. At every turning, the soldier on the right hand cut a gash in his flesh. The soldier on the left hand side struck him with a bludgeon, both saying at the same time, Will you go to Mass? Will you go to Mass? Does this bother you? Bothers me. He still replied in the negative to these interrogatives. And being at length taken to the bridge, they cut off his head on the balustrades and threw both that and his body into the river. Paul Garnier, a very pious Protestant, that means righteous, had his eyes put out, was then flayed alive, and being divided into four parts, his quarters were placed on four principal houses of Lucerne. He bore all his sufferings with the most exemplary patience, praised God as long as he could speak. Daniel Cordon of Rocapatia, being apprehended by some soldiers, they cut his head off, having fried his brains, ate them. Two poor old women. People say, God wouldn't cause his church to suffer. What about these people? They're believers. And a widow of La Torre with her daughter were driven into the river, and they're stoned to death. Paul Giles, on attempting to run away from the soldiers, was shot in the neck. Then they slit his nose, sliced his chin, stabbed him, and gave his carcass to the dogs. Michael Gonet, G-O-N-E-T, a man of 90, was burned to death. Baptist, Baptista Udri, both old man, was stabbed. And Bartholomew Froske had holes in his heels through which ropes were put. Then he was dragged by them to the jail where his wounds mortified and killed him. Magdalene de Pierre, being pursued by some soldiers and taken, was thrown down a precipice and dashed to pieces. Margaret Vevela and Mary Praveline, two old women were burnt alive. Michael Bellino with Anne Bacardino were beheaded. Cipriana Bustia being asked if he would renounce, renounce his religion and turn Roman Catholic replied, I would rather renounce life or turn dog. To which the priest answered, for that expression, you will both renounce life and be given to the dogs. They accordingly dragged him to, to prison where he continued a considerable time with it dislocated. He had yet again. It goes on and on. And what I did, I made copies of all these. Christopher Kober, as soon as he stepped upon the scaffold, said, I come in the name of God to die for his glory. Can you do that in America if they come down on us before it's over with? I have fought the good fight, finished my course, so executioner, do your office. The execution obeyed, and he instantly received the crown of martyrdom. No person ever lived more respected or died more lamented than John Schultes. The only words he spoke before receiving the fatal stroke were, The righteous seem to die in the eyes of fools, but they only go to rest. Lord Jesus, thou hast promised that those 
who come to thee shall not be cast off. Behold, I come. Look on me, pity me, pardon my sins, and receive my soul. Maximilian Hostielik was framed for his learning piety and humanity. When he first came to the scaffold, he seemed exceedingly terrified at the approach of death. The officer taking notice of his agitation, Hostilic said, Ah, sir, now the sins of my youth crowd upon my mind. But I hope God will enlighten me lest I sleep the sleep of death and lest mine enemies say we have prevailed. Soon after he said, I hope my repentance is sincere and will be accepted. Then he said, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation, at which words his head was struck off with one blow. That's enough reading. I hope this is shocking to you. It is to me. This is what the Roman Catholic Church did to the Protestants several hundred years ago in this Inquisition. This Inquisition lasted. It lasted six to seven hundred years. And lasting six to seven hundred years, the most conservative men who write about this say between 50 and 75 million Believers were tortured and killed by the Roman Catholic Church. Do you think that's fair? Well, welcome to the world of persecution. I'm just, I've never been so sick of the churches. And what's really surprising to me is the Baptists, the Pentecostals, they've all gone Roman Catholic. They're, they're walking down the aisle and accepting Christ. That comes from the Roman Catholic Church walking down the aisle and accepting the Eucharist. It goes back to Henry VIII. Well, what a, what a story. How much time do I have, Mike? Ten. Ten. It goes back to Henry VIII. Henry VIII was a womanizer. Henry VIII in England, he was under the Catholic Church. He wanted to divorce Catherine of Aragon, his wife. They would call them from the city they were from. She was from Aragon, so they called her Catherine Aragon. And he wanted to divorce her because she could have a son. She couldn't have a son or she didn't have a son that could take his kingdom. She had a son that was a dimwit, and they knew that he couldn't take the kingdom. So he said, I want to divorce Catherine. So he went to the Pope at that time. He said, I'd like to divorce Catherine so I can marry this Anne Boleyn down the road here, this young, good-looking girl, girl. Henry VIII was ugly as a mud fence. I don't know if you've seen pictures of him. He did not look like uh, Richard Burton like he played in that movie. Richard Burton's real handsome. Henry VIII is just an ugly, ugly guy. But since he was the king of England, he could get these young girls, and he wanted to marry Anne Boleyn. And then after that, he wanted to marry Jane Seymour because he's going to kill Anne Boleyn because she can't have the son he wanted. She has a daughter, Elizabeth, and they, you can see this in the movie, Anne of a Thousand Days. It's a good movie. It tells you all about it. And Anne lasted a thousand days. He finally said, I'll organize my own church if the Pope won't let me divorce Catherine. So he divorced her and then when Anne comes along and she can't have the son he wants, 
she has Elizabeth. And the funny thing is Elizabeth ends up being the greatest monarch up to that time that had ever ruled England. That one daughter he didn't like and didn't want. But anyway, so he decides to behead Anne Boleyn. And he does that. And then he goes down the road and gets this Jane Seymour. And he goes through a dozen or six or eight wives. I believe it was because he was a womanizer. And when he organized the Church of England, he kept his own form of the Pope, the Archbishop of Canterbury. When you hear that name, that's the big man in the Church of England. He's, he's Henry VIII's answer to the Pope. He keeps all that incense in there. And the one thing he keeps in there that is the important thing of the Roman Catholic Church. He didn't change the Catholic Church much. He just changed the name from Catholic to Church of England. And they kept in there where the people, where they utter these magical words, hoc est corpus e and fili. I don't know what he uttered in the, in the Church of England, but he supposedly turns that into the body of Christ. And they walk down the aisle and accept the Eucharist which is where I accept Christ comes from. Well, the Methodists came out of the Church of England, brought that system to America in the early 1800s, and the Church of England, they said, they brought it to America and put their own spin on it. And the Methodists would build a little fence around the front and they would tell people, you can come down here and agonize on this altar and try to accept Christ as your Savior. That bled over to the Baptist church, and they started giving invitation hymns. Jesus is not inviting anybody to follow him. He's commanding, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Take, deny, and follow or imperative moves in the Greek. That's a command. He's not inviting anyone. So they kept this, walk down the aisle and let Jesus come into your heart. And it ended up in the Baptist church. That's why I say the Baptists, the Pentecostals, they're all Roman Catholic. They not only have their rituals in the church, they have their holidays, Christ Mass, Ishtar, the whole thing. And they don't seem to care that they're involved. The whole nation is Roman Catholic. I love this book. This book that was written by this Spanish professor. He only writes in Spanish. His name is Caesar Vidal. The myth of Mary. What he is saying in this is the Roman Catholics have seen fit to worship Mary rather than Jesus or Jehovah God. They put her in front of everything. That's why she's a myth. Mary is not Mary. She is Venus, Aphrodite. She is all of those female deities that they put into the Catholic Church. But Mary was a real person, though, right? Well, sure she was. We're not talking about Mary. The Mary of Roman Catholicism is Venus. It's Milita. It's Aphrodite. They just simply... They have, they have these niches in the Catholic Church. If you're walking along a hallway, they've got a niche. You walk on, they've got another niche. In that niche, if this is a hallway, in that niche they got a statue, and they renamed Jupiter Peter, and they renamed Aphrodite Mary. It's not the Mary of the Bible. The thing is, the Roman Catholics have attributed to Mary things that's not true. They say that, that the reason they pray to Mary is because they say she can divert the wrath of Jesus. Jesus doesn't have any wrath. They say that Mary is the mediatrix. That's what they said about Mileta. Aphrodite means mediatrix, female mediator. There's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Everything they said about Mary is a lie because all they did was take the attributes of Aphrodite, Venus, and all those female deities. They say that you can get this out of McClinic and Strong under the word Ashtaroth. 
You can look at it and at the very end of that article. It will tell you that Venus was never worshipped in human form. Venus de Milo in the Louvre in Paris, she's got one arm or something like that. That's not the way she was worshipped in the ancient world. They tell you under Ashtaroth. They tell you under Ashtaroth that Venus was worshipped in the form of a cone. That's a Christmas tree. Mr. Layard says, since they were all worshipped in the stars, they put a star on top. That's the Christmas tree of Jeremiah 10. Learn not the way of the heathen. The way of the people are vain. They cut a tree out of the forest, the work of the, man's of work, the, work of the hands of a workman. They deck it with silver and gold. And it doesn't move, so they put it on a platform. If that's not the Christmas tree out of Jeremiah 10, like my wife says, I'll eat my hat and I don't even have a hat. I'll buy one and eat it. That's the Christmas tree. This is a hellish doctrine. I despise Christmas more than anybody despises it because it destroyed people and killed people and murdered them and it's put a substitute for God it's twisting the word of God I've got a paper here I was talking about twisting God's word you cannot come up and just make things to mean whatever you want them to mean eat flesh and drink blood is an idiom of the Jews We've got all kinds of idioms. Do I have any time, Mike? 90 seconds. 90 seconds. I was going to read you some of our idioms. Grease the palm, bring down the house, hold your horses, drive it into the ground, month of Sundays, hold a candle to it, to knuckle under, wild goose chase. How many more you want? They had all kinds of idioms. That'll be enough. I'll come back. And resume this message on Christmas that I hate. I hate the Christ Mass. The reason I hate it, they killed these believers. And they did it in the name of a lie. Let's pray. Father, thank you for truth. God, sometimes I don't know what all to say. Just, just pour the information out here to the people. Let them do what they will to do with it. I pray you'll give me strength to continue. I'm getting old. I'm getting weak. Just give me strength, Lord. And Lord, I'll give you praise for everything you do. Fight our battles. We've got a lot of enemies out there, Lord. Help us. We'll give you praise in Christ's name. Amen. I don't like Christmas because I'm a cheapskate. Well, that ain't the right reason not like it. The right reason is because it's a lie. Uh, I don't want to buy people presents. Well, that's that not the point. The point them. is, the point is, it's a lie. I bought somebody a present once ago. What am I going to do with this? That's it. I'm not celebrating this ever again. Well, it's wrong because it's a lie. A gift blinds the eyes. Blinds the eyes of the righteous. Huh? Well, that's the truth, whether anybody likes it or not. Well, Dave, I'm glad you're here. Me too. I don't think I've got a, any, uh, any more years left in my body, but well, I'm trying. Maybe the Catholics will take you out and kill you. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you call them and ask them, say, would y'all come and torture me and kill me? I'm ready to go. Come and get me. I don't like, I know it bothers some people for me to read out of this book, but it's truth. Huh? Well, bye, Kayla. <laughs>